oh, this is a good one, this is a good one. This isn't, ah, oh, man, I have contribution. I'll talk about these one day. But this is another thing my dad told me. This isn't necessarily like an original thought on my part. But he t- told me, um, actually, when I was, when I was like 19, I asked him about it. And he told me that he didn't even know what he meant by that. He told me he remembers vaguely telling me this, but he didn't even know what he meant by it. And I didn't even fully understand it at first, but I kind of understand what he meant now. And I I know I was eight when I learned this because I wrote it in my journal, which I burned when I was 14, so you guys aren't going to be seeing that. But my dad told me that basically he said, Every answer to every question that I may have, or anyone will ever have, like the questions that actually matter, every every story that was ever, ever told, every life of every person to ever live, even thousands of years ago, the secrets to the universe, the meaning of life, the answers to all unanswerable questions, everything that you will ever need to know is already in your own head. And it was so profound when he said that to me. I didn't understand it. And he said it with this context of like, we were watching a movie and the movie was about people who lived in like prehistoric times. And my dad was kind of implying like, oh, all the stuff they felt in that moment is already in here. It's already in your own brain. And I didn't get it at all. Um... But I knew it was important, so I wrote it down anyways, so I can look back on it. I thought about it for so many years. Like, how could I understand what somebody else, you know, was in their head? How could I... The main thing that stuck with me was like, he was like, yeah, what other people are thinking, what people have already done, the things that they have already done, it's already in your own head. And I'm like, how? I was thinking in a very shallow way. I wasn't thinking metaphorically at all. It was all literal. I was like, memories of people don't transfer over. I don't have anybody else's memories in my head except for my own. Um, you know, they don't get stored in your genes. Well, I, like, epigenetics is kind of popping off. But at the time, I didn't even know about that. I didn't even know how babies are made. How the, how could I know about epigenetics? But yeah, in my mind, it was like, it was kind of weird. He was trying to... I thought he was trying to convince me that, like, reincarnation is a thing or something like that. And I'm thinking, like, how the hell are the thoughts and minds of everyone who's ever lived in my mind? Like, that's the part that really stuck out to me. And now, I mean, earlier, but now especially, I really understand what he meant. It's not that, you know these people had these certain thoughts and desires and whatnot, and I can remember them, like, in some supernatural way. Like, I can remember somebody else's memories. It's that... It's that our minds are the same. It's not that we're different and I can figure out what's in their head. Um, like, I can understand that the, the... I can read the mind of someone different than me. But it's really that I'm the same as them. So what's in my head is also in theirs. And even though I, I couldn't put it into words, I would still tell this to people. Even back then, like in elementary school, I would go around telling this to people. And this is my, this is my contribution to philosophy. But I would say it's more of my dad's contribution. But he never, you know, went out telling people, telling these people. He told it to me. And I was, oh, you're spreading the word. I was the Plato to his Socrates. So it was like, I want to, I want to, I want to elaborate because this is going to, I, I want to make sure people understand. So like, think about, think about it in the way of a story, okay? A society cannot exist without stories, without storytelling. Like, stories exist in the deepest part of our brains. Like, actually think about it for a second, okay? Stories are so ubiquitous that nobody actually stops to think about how absurd they are. Like, nobody... Like, the thing about very ubiquitous things is, like, nobody's out here making 
um, reviews, YouTube reviews for air. You know, someone did it as a parody, but it's a parody for that very reason. But everyone's out here making reviews for Elden Ring. But way more people breathe air than, than play Elden Ring. Why are there not equally as many reviews for air? Because everybody understands it. Because it's so ubiquitous. A thing that everybody can relate to, that everybody can understand to, you don't need to make a review of that. You don't need to teach people that sort of thing. And with stories, stories are so ubiquitous, they're so universal, that nobody even realizes the absurdity of them on a logical level, like on an evolutionary level. Like a movie, for example. Like When you watch a movie, think about exactly what you're doing. Like, you're taking time out of your day. You probably have stuff to do. You could be productive, you know. You could be working out or you could be learning something. But instead, you choose to allocate out a time frame to waste time, basically. Not do anything that you could be doing. And you choose to sit down and do absolutely nothing with your body and just absorb some story that literally never happened. Literally just fiction. And even when someone films a movie that's non-fiction, that's not real life. Those are actors. There is no logical reason for you to actually take stories seriously other than the stories that, uh, you know, are filmed documentaries and stuff like that. In reality, when people go watch movies and TV shows... They're technically just wasting their time, but everyone still does it. And nobody, nobody goes like, nobody ever stops to think about this. Have you ever heard anybody else? Oh, I'm going to the movies. Why would you do that? Why would you waste your time? No, everyone gets it. Everyone knows why you would go to the movies. People might go like, oh, no, don't. It's going to take too much time. But nobody's ever questioning your motives for going to the movies. Everybody knows why you do it because everybody experiences that. Or even like bedtime stories. Like... Why do bedtime stories even work? Like, why do kids want to hear bedtime stories? I was never taught to enjoy bedtime stories. Like, I remember being four years old, and I would just demand bedtime stories, or else I threw a tantrum and I cried. Um, but, like, why? Like, what the hell is that story even doing for us? And it works on everyone, with very, very few exceptions and typically those exceptions are people who have had severe brain damage. But just about every person who has normal brain chemistry, these like stories works on everyone. You, the fact that you can go up to some random person and ask them what their favorite movie is, like think about the absurdity of that question that you're asking. Like, oh, hey, what is your favorite fictional story depicted in sound waves and pixels that never happened that you choose to waste your time on that you probably waste your time on multiple times over and over and over again even though you know what happens in it what's your favorite one of those um random person who i don't know and it's like you could think about the message that you're communicating to them you're literally like you're basically telling them that Oh, I'm not, I'm not in your head. I don't know what's going on in your head. But I know you so well that I'm going to make the assumption that you enjoy wasting your time to watch stuff that will never affect you in your life. Stuff that isn't even history, but stuff that literally never happened. On a screen, too, that has no depth perception. It can even be animated. Most people I know personally, their favorite movies are animated movies. And I'm just going to assume that you like them. I'm going to assume that this is something you enjoy. Like, dog, that's basically mind reading. The fact that you can even know this much about another person, it's so absurd that we like stories, but we all do, even babies. You put a kid who doesn't even know how to speak in front of a TV, they won't bother you for the entire time. They'll just be... a absolutely immersed in what's going on on the screen that's why so many kids have ipads with youtube kids on them so that like lazy parents um don't have to deal with raising their children because 
these stories resonate so strongly with everyone, even from birth. So it's an effective strategy for these lazy parents to not ra- to not go through the effort of raising their kids. Like we're born with this weird, intrinsic desire to to experience stories. So here's the deal. Some stories resonate with people, like the hero's journey and stuff. And some stories don't. Like if I say, like, scissors, that's it. That's my story. Thanks for listening to my story called Scissors. Well, that doesn't resonate with anyone. Well, if enough people see this, it'll probably resonate with a few people. But you know what I mean. You get my point. It's not a story. So although it is difficult, although this kind of thing would be difficult, you can, in theory work backwards and 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 think about all the possible combinations of of thoughts and ideas you can have in every possible order and trace back what actually makes up a story that resonates with people and it's not that you need to actually listen to every story and figure out what resonates with you but it's it's that like it's like sorting algorithms. You could find a more efficient way to do it, but you could, in theory, find the formula as to what makes stories resonate with people simply in your own head. You don't need to talk to a single person to to figure out what stories or rather why stories resonate with people simply by looking at what resonates with you when you think about it. And that will actually trace back to the fundamental stories of humans and like the motivations and the desires and the struggles and the ups and downs and the great potential for um, immense pleasure and terrible suffering. Like you'll understand all of it if you work backwards like this. And just like that, although it it is a magnitude more difficult than being taught it, Everything that you will ever need to know about anyone or your own life, all of the important things, rather, not like the menial, like, oh, what's the 10,000th digit of pi? No, all the things that actually matter in life, all the decisions, all the things that will drive you, that, that you need to take into account when making real important decisions, they're all already in your head. It just depends on how much effort you're willing to take to open them up. And there are some smart people out there who have worked their whole lives piecing together the fundamental stories of mankind. In fact, this is a great way you can actually define intelligence. I think it's an excellent way. It's like how far people are willing to, to open up their brains and, and uncover the secrets to their own minds. That is a great measure for discerning one's intelligence depending on how you would define intelligence i think it's a great definition it's a definition for sure one of many but that's a topic for a different day i didn't really understand all this when i was eight though um but i had an inkling of it so because i had an inkling of it i'm including it from when i was eight i literally go around and tell this to get like the reason why I know I had an inkling of it is because I would share it. Like, right as I got into the third grade, um, I remember I'd go around and I'd tell all the kids in my class, and I'd met kids, like there's one girl in particular, um, who understood what I was saying, and she resonated with it the same way I did. And I knew, like, like after telling her that, I knew, like, oh, she's awesome. I had a crush on her because of how smart she was. But I knew, like, oh... These are the people I should stick around. And of course, I don't remember the names and faces. I remember her name and face, but I don't remember the names and faces of all these other people. I remember telling a bunch of people at lunch and stuff, um, and then like telling them the the plot to like Three Idiots and things like that. Uh, it was all these things were just as profound to me. There's a good um, Exerbia video out there. Uh, that explains this 
well. Here, let me let me pull it up. I have the link here. It's, it's in my bookmarks. Okay, I'll, I'll open it up in in this window here. Recently, we've got pretty clever with telling stories, like setting the plot out of time, setting the plot in space, disregarding the plot entirely, but I don't think much has changed about what we like in a story. For all of our postmodern yada yada, stories basically still just come down to to. Does characters what we like escape from this ungood situation? I hope they don't get murderized or nothing. Does characters what we like love each other and want to make out and stuff? Is what we thought the story was the real story or is there a twist with the robot man or a dubious soap salesman at some point? And while that's all well and gravy, I'm going to propose a little theory of everything about why we like stories when we like them and why we really don't when we don't. And it's called feelings, pictures, slash context, and ideas. And it works like this. If a movie or a book or whatever only cares about feelings, then it's either really crap young adult fiction or daytime television. We get that the characters have emotions, we just don't really care because we don't understand where they are in their lives or what's going on and they don't propose anything new. If a movie or a book only cares about pictures or context, well, then you get a story that's obsessed with the weather or the cinematography or what the moon looks like and everyone knows what the fucking moon looks like. If a movie or a book only cares about ideas... This is something I, I, I can actually break down even further. Um, but there, there's a lot of overlap with, in particular, the whole idea of aesthetic versus narrative. And um, I think the old Digibro of aesthetic is narrative is a really, really good starting point. But I think there's a lot of expansion that can be done. Like, that's scratching the surface. But yeah, um, for for someone who does, like, just in general, just like philosophical comedy videos, it's, um, it blows my mind that he has such a, such an intuitive understanding of story. That's great, but it's usually boring as shit, and you get unrelatable science fiction or art movies where people just vomit their opinions about things like no one does in real life ever, except narcissistic pricks like, I don't know, YouTubers, for example. But if you properly pickle That's that a pineapple and you include all three that feels like a personal attack, dude. That feels hella personal. Three, you get a classic. When a writer or a director gets feelings, pictures, and ideas working properly together, we can forgive basically everything else. I think that's why you can still watch Citizen Kane, or Twelve Angry Men, or read Moby Dick, or Shakespeare decades or centuries later, and they're still brilliant. They're addressing feelings we have today about death, or love, or whales, or crybaby Danish princes. They're using interesting contexts like huge castles, or the ocean, and they're throwing us ideas we don't think about that much on a daily basis. Should you be or not be? What's the big deal with Moby's Willy anyway? Further example, everyone bangs on about The Empire Strikes Back being the superior Star Wars. The, the highest and most valuable art form is comedy. And the fact, like, if you can if you can make jokes like this like this is an intelligent guy like the videos he makes i often um look at like people's videos and i'm like oh this is kind of impressive or whatever um and i i i think about it and i'm like what would it take for me to make a video like this like not after having seen it like what would it have taken for me to have ended up in the position where i would make a video in the same way of that same quality and everything. And I look at this dude's videos and I'm like, I can't do it. Like I'm not capable of making videos at this guy's level. Like these videos are too good. They like, he thinks of things that I simply can't imagine myself ever piecing together. He's a really, really intelligent person, super underrated videos. Wars movie, blah blah, and that's probably because it definitely is. 
But if we apply the old feelings, pictures, and ideas model to it, I think it's pretty clear why it was indeed amazing. Well, there's certainly feelings. Everyone's in a pinch. Everything's shit. Darth Vader wants everyone dead. There's interesting pictures. There's the pretty snowy bits, and the spacey bits, and the cloudy bits. And there are lots of ideas about loyalty, and sacrifice, and making out with members of your own family. To be even simpler about this, stories just have to be about someone we understand, set somewhere vaguely interesting, and propose something, anything, even remotely new that we haven't thought about too much before. They are also required to make sense. The main character can then be a robot, or a drug-addled horse, or a personified teddy bear. <laughs> what a story, Mark. For more popular examples of feelings, pictures, and ideas done perfectly, there is the Blink episode of Doctor Who with all the terrifying garden features, the entire first season of Mindhunter, the Christmas episode of Black Mirror, mm, The Great like Gatsby, that. Cloud Atlas, the book, that is, Catch-22, To Kill a Mockingbird, original fucking Bioshock, and Wild <laughs> Tales. That's us, the storytelling ape. Sure, we stopped pooping in the woods and huffing volcano vapor. Damn, the storytelling ape. What a nice way to word it. Well, maybe you did, but not too much has changed with human hardware, with the brain. We still seem to be telling basically the same stories our ancestors enjoyed, and most of them centre around romance, power, and shouty robot people. Primal stuff, right? Yeah, okay, why? Because this is- it, What's funny is that even the, the shouty robot stuff actually is really primal, somehow. Even though there doesn't seem to be any evidence of you know, ancient humans ever experiencing that sort of thing, it really does seem to trigger the same primal mechanics within us. Maybe there was, you know, some giant uh, robot apocalypse that happened way, way, way in the past that, um, you know, we just, we, just, we don't know about is lost to history or something like that, you know? It's our conditions. That probably didn't happen, but... It's, it's kind of odd how um, you can make that joke and everyone will resonate with it. Still, balancing between being animals and gods. We care about base stuff, but we want a bit of clever mixed in too. We evolved in tribes. We love gossip and the feelies. We evolved in nature. We like scenery and contact. See, that's what I want to talk about that again. Um, not again. I want to talk about that as well, which is like, we like gossip. We like drama. And... Everyone, like, drama has become such a bad word. Like, drama is such a stigmatized word now. Drama is not a bad thing. Like, literally, it is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. Like, we like a drama. There's no problem with that. Um, when people talk about drama, the like, the colloquial definition of what people consider drama to be, typically there's a problem with that. You know, if you're, if you're keeping up with the Kardashians, yeah, there's a problem with that. But... Drama in general, like, if you're a YouTuber and you're just, you're out here in the community and you're watching Keemstar or whatever, yeah, there ain't nothing to it. But that is a topic for a different day. And you know what? I am positive that will come up because I do, I do like reacting to drama. Next, we also evolved the Lamborghini. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure eventually a, a controversial time will come up in the future where somebody will go like, Oh, Froz, why do you get involved in so much drama? Because I like it. And then I'll have to justify it. And then I'll, um, that's when I'll really get into it. You know, because I don't really have the effort to go through that right now. And the feelies. We evolved in nature. We like scenery and context. We also evolved the Lamborghini of brain areas, the neocortex. So we seem to be really into ideas like ethics and politics and putting watches up your bottom. We're designed to feel stuff, see stuff and think stuff. Stories seem to work when they mimic those basic needs. And more than that, telling stories is a fundamental human activity, I reckon. And if you needed to kick up the arse to make your- Facts. Not, not you reckon. That's facts, bro. Own stuff, I will attempt to provide it. Now. I doubt you know much about who your great-great-great-grandparents were. I certainly don't know anything about mine. And truth be told, it's very unlikely that your great-great-great-grandchildren will know much about you. But one day, our distant descendants will probably get curious about who we were and what we thought about the world, and they'll look back at the stories we're telling now, to our literature and our movies and our video games and our TV and everything else. That's how we build time capsules. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying all our media is great, but hot diggity we're making some good stuff at the moment, and hot diggity I'm sure lots of it will survive for a long time after we're gone. And the cool thing is that there's really not much stopping any of us from making our own stuff in one form or another. Not necessarily to be immortalized, but just to have said a true thing about where we are now. Because the world won't look like this forever, and we won't be here forever. 
Humans are transient. Stories are eternal, or as eternal as we'll be getting anytime soon. It's a little nod to future generations. Hey, we were here. We felt stuff. We saw stuff. We thought stuff. Love and kisses from the 21st century. And we also saw the first launch of the Falcon Heavy, so fuck you. It's debatable whether cryogenics or mind uploading will take off in our lifetimes. We're probably not going to be the first immortal generation. But if you can say a true thing about how we feel about the world right now, and what it looks like, and what we think about it, there is every chance that that will stick around. Happy making things, mother lovers. All the best. Ciao. Wow. I, I, as he was saying that, it's been a while since I watched this video, but as he was saying that whole spiel, um, there were parts in there where I'm like, okay, I gotta be sure to mention that and then I could uh, expand more on that. But he kept saying more and more profound stuff as he was going. And I'm like, damn, I can't keep track of all this. I'm not writing any of this down. So, and I didn't want to pause it. No way I'd, I'd be, I, I could never, I could never pause that kind of thing. That's not, that's not my decision to make, you know? I'm not worthy of, of pausing that sort of thing. But damn, what a way. I couldn't have said it better myself. I couldn't have said it that good myself. Like, this is what I mean. I can't think of this stuff. <clears throat> I can't think of this stuff. Like, I literally can't. But he said something about, um. you know, your, your great, 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 great grandparents probably have no idea who you were. And you probably have no idea who they were. And... You know, future generations down the line, your great, 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 great grandchildren are not going to know who you are. Chances are. And you don't know who they are either. But you kind of can understand who they are by understanding yourself. Because the human brain doesn't, it doesn't evolve so rapidly. It isn't so quick to change um, in the grand scheme of things. We're not individual brains that live in our own individual pockets of, of the world. We're a species. You separate a human from the rest of the humans, they're done. You can hardly even call them a human after a certain point. All of their all of the characteristics that make them human, their humanity, evaporates if they don't have other humans around them. Um, or other, even things that they consider human to stick around them. Like that, uh, that Tom Hanks movie where he was stranded on that island. That was based on a true story, right? I remember that being based on a true story. But when, um, when my dad told me that, uh, that everything that has ever, all the emotions and experiences and um, life lessons that can come for everyone else is already in my head. When he told me that, a part of me understood it. Because the context that, that we were, we were watching a movie, and that context gave me an alley-oop. Like, yeah, this dude who lived 10,000 years BC on, on the TV screen, they weren't me. But at least I can imagine myself in his shoes. At least I can relate to him. Like, hypothetically, I can imagine myself. Mirror neurons, you know? If I couldn't, if I couldn't relate, then... I wouldn't be interested in watching. It wouldn't pull me in, but it does. It does immerse me. And the simple fact that we can even imagine what others go through, like the sophistication of having enough self-awareness to understand that other human beings are also equally self-aware and that we can simulate their minds That's such a, that's a miracle if you think about it. Like how, how can we even do that? No other animal does this whole um, mirror neuron thing on this scale. I, that's, uh, I shouldn't say that, but on this scale, no other animal even comes close. Um, you can tell that elephants do a lot of that. Um, you can tell uh, dolphins and, and creatures like that do a lot of that, but you know, orcas and stuff, but yeah, dogs, ants, 
bears, yeah, you don't see much of that in um in the rest of these animals, much of this um not not only would you call it self awareness you would call it collective self awareness or maybe you I would call it that you know because I haven't actually like really studied studied any of this, but um I, I don't know what um vocabulary is in the subject. But it's just stuff I thought of on my own, and it's that that seems to be a way to phrase it to me. But it's it's so crazy when you think about it. My dad, he he basically told me like, oh, if there is a question that needs to be answered out there, and it, it's a genuinely important question, I already know the answer. If I don't know the answer, that means the question's not important. Um, it's important in context. It's a, it's important because the time period we're living in, um, because of the weather. Uh, that that the the that humanity is in because of the the trends and things like that you know but if if something if there's a truly important question that needs to be asked like the the meaning of life or or something like that you know is there a heaven or hell is there a god like the the questions that actually truly matter i already know the answer that that that's what my dad was trying to tell me he said that everyone knows the answers and I understood like I, I kind of understood what he was telling me which is which that in itself proves it like if my dad had explained that to me and it didn't make sense and I'm like confused I'm like, bro what are you saying that means he's trying to teach me something I don't already know but it resonated with me and I thought to myself you're right dad but how can I say that? Nobody ever taught me that before. So how could I know if he was right or wrong? No, I already knew. He said it, and I knew he was right. But how did I know he was right? Like, there, uh, an example of this is like, like a real world example is, um, my brother for the longest time has been really lazy and insecure about releasing his music. And I told him like, just release it. Don't worry about getting it perfect. Just set a deadline and release what you have by then. And he goes like, even if it's not good enough, should I just put out trash? And I went like, yes, you should. Like I skipped a, a whole bunch of um, steps of, of arguing in your own head, playing devil's advocate with yourself. And I skipped right to the end and I said, yes, you absolutely should release the trash if that's what you end up making. And like, it was like, um, I believe it was Jake from Adventure Time that said, like, sucking at something is the first step to being kind of good at something. And I gave him this, like, two-hour lecture. And by the end of it, I told him something like, it was really cool what I said. It was like, I was like, you don't release your music because it's good or bad or people will like it or not like it. You release your music because it's yours. Because you made it and then he he completely changes his attitude like throughout the whole lecture i was giving him and by the end of it he was like yeah you make a good point and he said he told me he's like I, he told me i make a good point but then again how would he know how would he know if i made a good point that means that he already knew what i said was true here somewhere in his head he already understood that what I was saying was right. But he just wasn't accessing that part of his brain yet. It was like I was testing him. And he gave me the wrong answer. And then, instead of me grading his paper, he graded his own paper. He looked in his own head and said, yeah, you're right. He graded himself and found out he was wrong. In reality, if he had dug deep enough, if he had done enough introspection and he had thought about this topic you know deeply on his own um without me telling him about it i'm not saying like be an absolute like super genius think of it all on the spot i'm saying think about these things in your own time like this is what meditation time is for you know this is what bandagi is for like think think about these things be alone in your own thoughts in your own head and if he had done this enough he could have seen that he had the answer key all along. 
But there was this other part of his mind, as Hamza calls it, the Jeffrey part of your mind, the part that was like speaking, you know, the, the outspoken part, the part that was insecure, that blocked this deeper Adonis, uh, more intelligent, the answer key part of his mind. The part that was actually giving answers wasn't the part that held the answer key. You need to listen to the part that has the answer key, because that answer key is actually the true answer key to what you need in life. And this, this weird argument, this weird battle that we have among all the different parts of our brains manifests itself in this like really beautiful way of like there uh, one part of his brain basically made him insinuate in the beginning that something is true that another part of his brain knew is not true and that part of his brain that knew it that had the answer key he didn't need me to teach him that with enough thinking he could have figured it out on himself did he no he doesn't do a lot of introspection. He doesn't do a lot of playing devil's advocate in his own head. But he could. Of course, not all the literal answers to the world are already in your own head, you know? Like I mentioned this earlier, you're not going to know the 10,000th digit of pi without being taught it, okay? But the things in life that really matters, that really help you make decisions um, about... Uh, relationships, like uh, friendships, family, about um, going around, seeing the world, about um, deciding what to do with your life, like the the things that that really drive you, and and really the the hard decisions in life, the decisions that really matter, that you should be thinking about making. And everything in life that is actually worth knowing even, I'd go that far. Everything in life that is actually essential to know for, for the human experience, that is worth knowing, all the essentials that you need to, to live a full life for yourself, to, to understand your future, to help others, you already know all of that stuff. You already have it all in your own head. And think about it, if you didn't, then advice would never even work on you to begin with. You can't learn it. You can't learn from a quote. Like, the fact that quotes even exist is proof of this. Like, people would, people would hear advice, or let's say somebody would tell you some, a piece of advice, and you don't already know it, you would just ignore it. If I tell you this advice, like, like, um, if I tell you, oh, I have a piece of advice for you. If you're feeling sad, then go take a gun and shoot yourself in the foot. It'll make you feel better. You can take what I'm saying as advice, and you could say you learned something from it. And that's, that's learning. But you don't do that. You take what I'm saying, and you go, no, you're wrong. But when you do that, what you're really doing is looking at your answer key and checking and, and seeing whether I'm right or wrong. I'm not teaching you a new piece of information. That information is already locked inside your head. When you hear a good piece of advice, like, it just unlocks that. If you, if somebody gives you a piece of advice, like, oh, delete your social media, it'll, it'll make you feel happier. I tell that to people. And they know it's true. But if you didn't, if you truly didn't know that deleting your social media wasn't healthy, and you didn't actually believe it, it would sound like nonsense. Because... I mean, look at how how much we're drawn to it. But no, everyone who hears that advice goes, yeah, that's true. I shouldn't be on social media as much as I am right now. But the only way you know that's true is if you knew it to begin with. When people give advice, here is, oh, damn, I'm really, I'm really playing a deep meta game here. But this is the best advice I can ever give to anyone. Okay, this is the best advice I can ever give. If you're giving someone advice, you're never actually teaching them anything. You're just reminding them of what they already know. That's a quote. I want to write that down. Give me a sec. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write that down. Uh...
I know my keyboard sounds like I'm typing really, really fast. I'm actually not, but um, it's it, my keyboard just makes a lot of noise. I'm not actually really typing that fast. But yeah, if you're giving someone advice, you're never actually teaching them anything. You're just reminding them of what they already know. And to the people that are, are watching this right now, that are listening to me, you guys are like, yeah, this all sounds legit, right? To the one viewer, probably a bot. But like, how would you know that? How could you say it sounds legit if you didn't already know what I'm saying was already true? You didn't know that that wasn't already in your head. How can you, what I'm trying to say is, how can you confirm a piece of information to be true or false if there isn't already a database of true information to cross-reference? And there is. It's already in your brain. It's in a deeper part of your brain. It's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to access, but it's there. And that's why what I'm saying resonates with you. Uh, hopefully. I, maybe what I'm saying is nonsense. But when my dad told it to me, it resonated with me. And I, I hope I'm getting that message across right now. Even though he said it in a very, very simple way. One sentence. And I'm really, really expanding. But I hope I can convey the message that he gave to me. But it's... But if it does resonate with you, then that's proof that it's self, that, that, that this is true. The lecture that I gave just now just proved itself correct through pure logic alone. Damn, I'm, I'm really proud of this one. I can't believe my dad said that. What an unbelievable like thought to have. And to tell an eight-year-old kid, like, you expect him to understand that? I didn't understand that until way later. Like, just to be clear, I'm not, like, this super smart, like, I just do a lot of this introspection. I just do a lot of thinking. But my mind is not particularly fast. And, and I don't make the best decisions. My, okay, you don't make the best. I don't make decisions that I, I look back on and I'm, I'm proud of. I, I make a lot of decisions even nowadays that I end up regretting very shortly afterwards. I don't have the most self-control either. So, and I procrastinate a lot. And I do a lot of things that I know I shouldn't do. And I don't do a lot of things that I know I should do. So, I'm not trying to like flex my like mental aptitude. I, I, just, I just think about this stuff a lot. Not in an efficient way, just a lot. Work hard, not smart. But it's, it's... It's interesting that when um, I, I give this lecture to quite a few people and it's because I like to, I like to make jokes, you know, I like to say, I'm not like the funniest dude either, but I'll, I'll often tell people like, I'll tell them something and then I'll give them, and then I'll give them the explanation and I'll explain them all of this. But now that you're in this in this mind state after hearing all this you can understand what i mean when i tell people i tell these people people on a regular basis you can understand what i mean when i say if someone on twitter asks you like hey what's your source and you reply with i made it up that really is the best response because the, the important questions that actually need answering they're already in your head you making them up has just as much merit as you actually going out and finding the answer. 